The Lord be with you, everyone, and it's good to be back after having been in Houston and had a wonderful time with the people there. And before we plunge into what we're talking about tonight, thank you every one of you that have been sending an offering. It is your offerings that enable us to continue this uh, program week by week. And especially as the summertime is with us and many people on vacation sort of forget momentarily until the fall. Thank you, you remembered, those of you that have sent, and I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. But now I want you to turn with me um, to a subject. It's actually a massive subject, um, and I'd probably return to it more than once. But let's read from Hebrews in chapter 4. Hebrews in chapter 4. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed enter that rest. And then further down, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his God's rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from him. His. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Okay, that's a rather lengthy passage, but I wanted you to get the full punch of what that passage was saying, that there is a rest, and that rest is, in fact, the rest of God, and we are called to enter that rest, and it would uh, be correct to say, reading that passage, the essence, the essence of the good news is that you now enter into God's own rest. That's what it's saying. And he's comparing persons in the Old Testament who they'd heard that good news, but they failed to enter that rest. And so they wandered in the wilderness in a terrible chaos and frustration, no rest. So what's it talking about? Okay, it begins back there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. It, you remember the creation was through six days, and it was on the morning of the sixth day that God created the great... Um, uh, apes, the gorillas, the the monster creatures whose uh, understanding is a lot closer to the human, but that's where it stopped. And then it says a great rest came. He says uh, there was uh, quietness, and God said, let us, speaking to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man, mankind, in our image and in our likeness. And so mankind in Adam came into being on the afternoon of the sixth day. And then it says of the seventh day that God rested from all his works. Let me read that to you, Genesis 2 and verse 2. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it or made it holy, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. God rested. The creation unfold through six days to its finale in mankind, and then God rested. Now, I think it's obvious, but let me say it, that this rest that God has is not one of exhaustion. Please, 
I mean, I said it's pretty obvious. It isn't that God sat back exhausted and said, well, what a week that has been. No, this is, is a rest. How can I put it? It's the rest, I suppose, best understood of an artist. Uh, because that's exactly what God had revealed himself to be. It, it is that pleasure, wh whichever kind of art you're involved in, it has a similarity. If you're painting a picture, if you're writing a book, if, if you're sculpting, if it's pottery, whatever, there is that moment when you as the artist you stand back, you put down the brush, you put down the pen, you put down the chisel, and you contemplate what you have done, and you know that's it. You cannot do any more. You cannot subtract from what you have done. It is as perfect as you, the artist, can make it. It is your imagination actually now put before you in paint or stone or words, whatever. And so that, that's rest. You have rested, not because you were tired. But you, it, it's the pleasure of contemplating with total satisfaction that the work you set out to do is completed. And it's according to everything you intended it to be. It fits into your imagination of what it should be. And it's your pleasure. And that rest is the reverse of exhaustion. It's an invigorating, it, it, it's refreshing, it's contentment. Now, can I take all of what I've just said and say that's what was happening here on the seventh day? It was God resting, contemplating all that he had made. And if you remember another way of putting it here in that chapter one, it says he saw all that he has made. He said, it's very good. That is, he contemplated it as total satisfaction. He's completed the work. It fits exactly what he had purposed and the pleasure that rises within him because of such. And, and, and there you, you begin to see the invigorating uh, joy of the Holy Trinity, that refreshing, that shalom, that peace, contentment. And let me add it again and underline it in purple. Nothing can be added. That, that would destroy the whole jolly thing, you see. Uh, and again, back to the painting. It, you, you could add one brush stroke and, and it would destroy it. No, we're here. That's it. God looked at what he had done. Nothing can be added. It is perfection. Nothing can be taken away for the same reason. It's perfection. He's delighted in what he has created. And as I said, Adam had been created in the last hours of the creation week, or putting it just simply Friday afternoon, last hours. And he opened his eyes. Have you thought of this? He opened his eyes to a world that was finished. You, you realize everything was finished on Friday morning, except for him. When he opens his eyes, he's opening his eyes to what the Creator had said was good, finished, done, beautiful. And it is all waiting for him to enjoy at every level of his being. He's not greeted in his creation with a bucket and spade and said, well, I wasn't quite finished over here. If you could come and help, you know. No, no. As I said, there's nothing left to do. It's finished. All the food that Adam would ever need is right there, hanging on the trees before his eyes. All the drink from the cascading rivers that run through Eden, all the delight to his senses in a park of beauty surrounded by other creatures that are there just to delight his senses. And he opened his eyes, according to Genesis 2, with the Creator hovering over him. Have you ever thought of that? The Creator was hovering over him in love, extreme love. For it says that the Creator breathed into him the breath of life. And the words there actually uh, picture 
what would be mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. You could say that the Creator kissed Adam into life. He's hovering over him, and the mouth of God is breathing into him the breath of life. And there's a delight, and I, I could almost say there's the laughter of delight as the Creator welcomes him into the glorious world that has been made for him. Now, Adam, well, the, the first, <coughs> after he's been created, the first next event is the great rest of God. The very first thing that Adam confronts after his um, creation is that here is God at rest and communicating that rest with him that he would join with the Creator and receive the finished work of creation as his own finished gift and delight in that gift in the fellowship with his Creator. Can, can you begin to feel this? I mean, therein is total freedom from anxiety. There, there is no pressure on Adam to do anything to make something happen in order to bring about a better world. No, he's, he's freed, freed from anxiety. There is this incredible pulsing health of stillness and ease and joy. Elsewhere in the scripture, as this is unfolded, it's associated with release and freedom. You're not under any obligation to try to improve on creation. You're not under any obligation to find some fault with it to get rid of it. All you, all you have, your life is, it's done, so now therefore let's plunge into this incredible creation and discover what's there. See, it's God's rest. He has done the work. He has brought it to pass. All Adam can do is w w wake up to this and enter and celebrate it with God. But just a minute. D don't get the impression that God rested in what he had done up till noon on Friday. The rest of God included Adam. That that is, when, when God the Creator said that He's finished and His work is perfection, enough, that enough and perfection included Adam. So, Adam stands, or when I say Adam, we can say mankind, it includes you and I. He, he's, he was at the pinnacle of the works of creation. That, that is, all of the week of creation comes to its finale in Adam. If you look at it one way, he was the reason for the whole six and a half days. It's the same as when you prepare the nursery in your house and every little detail of the nursery and the placing of the crib and so on and so on. And then the, you bring the baby home. Well, the whole jolly room is about the baby and, and, and the baby is, is, is all part of your, your feelings, not just the nursery. <coughs> well, you see, Adam was made other than all other creatures he was made in the image and the likeness of God. No, don't, don't say that too quickly. You see, he's a creature. Understand that. A creature. The same as the creatures that had come to be in the morning. The, the same, the creatures that filled the latter half of the week. What, what's a creature? Hear me carefully. A creature is a not God. A not God is a not God creature. God made the creature. Creator, creature. Creator made the creature. So the creature isn't God. He's a not God. A and he's a human made, fashioned, formed, 
Ah, oh, yes, that's 101% true. But this one is quite other. This one makes your jaw drop. This one stands, and there's a chasm between Adam and the latest ape. A chasm that cannot be crossed. Adam, mankind, you and I, in our very makeup, we are wired to receive the gift of being the visible residence of God in creation. We are made in his image and in his likeness. Do you, do you understand that? We're not just brute beasts. We don't we, we share the fact that we're creature, we're not God, but but we are given this gift, and the gift means that we're, we're made for this. We're fashioned for it. Every nerve of our body is part of our ability to be a derived, dependent creature, participating in the very life of the Creator. He didn't just make us. He said he's going to join us and we are going to be his visible representation within creation. You, you could say it, it's a limited illustration, but it's like a container. You know, in the New Testament, it uses the expression, we have this treasure in earthen vessels or clay pots. God was made, uh, Adam was made to be a container of the Creator, a container. And that's a limited illustration because we're not just sort of parts in which God dumps himself. Now, as I said, within the very nerve system, within our organs, with our atomic structure, we're made to be filled with the fullness of God, a container. But you've got to add to that one who derives life, derives their life derives the life of their very being, not merely physical life. We're created to receive, created to actually participate in the life, the fellowship, the Creator. In fact, Adam, mankind, you and I, we are so incredible. I keep using that word, but you know, it says in, in the Psalms, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you could translate that into more modern, that, that we are jaw-droppingly. I mean, have you ever looked at the wonder of who you are? Have you ever contemplated when all the idiot scientists get out of the way and try and convince you your grandfather was an ape uh, now, and, and realize what, what your imagination, realize thought process, realize choices? And I could go on. You know what I mean. We are so wonderful. We are so wonderful. We're the only creature that must choose to be the dependent creature and not an independent God. We are so like God. We're not, but oh, we're, 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 we're in such a wondrous union that we have to choose to be the dependent creature. Adam's completion, his place in that rest of God, was in his receiving by faith, deriving all that he is from the Creator, and knowing that his perfection, his being enough, is never to be found within himself. It, it's, he's not completed from within himself. He, he's completed because of the Creator who lives within him. And then he, he's complete. He's the creature in whom God dwells. And in that fellowship, you have this wondrous being. And, and when God looked at that, he said, it's complete, it's done. All creation is complete, and now my man, my woman, in whom I dwell, and 
I am revealed inside their createdness. God is revealed in the not God creature. And so the creature is fulfilled in recognizing of my own self, I have nothing, but he is everything. And in that union of I have nothing in myself and the I am who is enough and everything dwells in me, complete. And when I say complete, I mean complete in every sense we've been using the word. We're not half finished. We're not a work in progress. And Adam joining God's rest is that he delights in that completeness. And he has to dismiss with a flip of the hand any thought that he's incomplete. He is enough. There in union with God, the creature in union with the Creator is enough to be the fantastic human being he's created to be. You see, a real human being is what I've just described, and you must understand that. This is not an optional extra. Adam wasn't part of a new denomination down the street. This is is creation. This is where we began. This is what we're supposed to be. This was the blueprint. He is to know in his very core being that without and apart from the Creator, he can do nothing. I said that. He is to embrace this responding to God love with the heartfelt yes of agreement and joyfully submitted to him to delight with God who now rests in his completed, finished and perfect work to which nothing can be added or subtracted. Can you get this? There was nothing left to add to Adam. Hmm. He was finished by God's action. He was beyond improvement. He was all that God had ever planned and intended him to be. Wired to receive and reveal and delight in the being of God who is love. And, well, what can I say? (laughs) It is. Uh, That's so hard for us to even understand. It is, period, is. Adam just is in this wondrous relationship. God is, Adam is, and there they are. Two yet one. That's the plan. let, Let me push that a bit. It, it's not that Adam now is being given some help to, um, in some struggling effort, image God, you know, like, like you'll hear it preached on many a Sunday morning. You've got to try and be like Jesus. Oh, come on. Try to be like Jesus? That's a far cry from you is. No, it's not that. It didn't mean that Adam was now to try to be like imitating God out of his own strength and ability. He wasn't strengthened to do that. That was part of the absolute no. If I is in God, I'm not trying to be like him. Nor, Nor does it mean that God took over Adam as sort of a coup. It, it, it isn't that um, he, he is this, this, he's been taken over, so now he's a non-person, he's a nothing, he's a zero, and he's just been absorbed into God. And again, you're going to hear it, people stand up and say, well, I'm nothing, I'm no good. You say, and Jesus is every, well, no, that's not, I know what you're trying to say, but it's not, no, it's not truth. It, you, you, created by the fingers of God, magnificent, exalted above every other creature. And God is going to join you, and you are a glorious we. It wasn't a takeover. It, it, this is idea, I've got to die, I've got to die. And, well, then that means you're a zero. There's nothing left. No, what the death was to any idea that you could do this by yourself. 
That's when you die, but the, <laughs> that only leaves you to live for the first time. You discover your true personhood, and in that true personhood, the other person of your Creator lives within you. And is the glory there? Neither did Adam become a limp puppet. I've, I've seen this. I've actually been on platforms where other speakers have, have, have illustrated it. They put their hand in a sock. And then they moved their hand, you see, and they said, well, you're the sock and God's the hand. And he, that makes me, uh, makes me an old sock. It means me a limp puppet. And God is the puppeteer. He's pulling the strings. And all I'm doing is I'm a programmed puppet or a programmed robot, whatever. No, you are fully alive because you are inside of God and God is inside of you. And for you to live is this glorious God. So it's God celebrating his choice to dwell in Adam, Adam's choice to allow it to be so and receive all that it entails. Two distinct persons, yet they're functioning as one. God one with the creature, Adam expressing himself through the creature's will and mind and feelings. So life for Adam, living out of that rest, was, I say, to discover the vast wealth of life, and that will take him the rest of his days, to discover this creation, not to improve on it, but to see what it's there for, and to enjoy it. Uh, and that's, I think, the, the humor and, and the creativity of God that he would share with Adam is that he hid a whole bunch of stuff under the earth. It, <laughs> he said, go look for it. You know, and he hid more stuff inside rocks. And it, it's all, oh, uh, that, that's like discovering this vast wealth without anxiety discovering his strength in me and not realizing where the end is, discovering the limitlessness of his love and his peace. Oh, just a minute. Sin. What is sin? Because that came along in chapter 3. Ah, now you're in a better place to understand it. Sin, what, well, I was going to say was, is the ultimate refusal to enter into God's rest. Now, that, that, I believe, will get a lot of stuff out of the way. Because, you know, we, we've been told sin is a lot of things. Uh, things you mustn't do, mustn't do. No, sin at, at base is the refusal to enter God's rest. That will produce a whole lot of crazy behavior. So, so what do I mean? Adam was deceived. Satan comes into the garden and has a friendly chat in which there is this lie that Adam is incomplete. Well, that's the reverse of the rest. God is celebrating the absolute completeness of Adam the enoughness of Adam. And Satan says, now, look, old chap, if you will eat of that tree that your creator seems paranoid about you not getting close to, um, then you will become as God. You see, you will become. What does that mean? You're not it right now. There's something that you've got to do in order to complete yourself because right now you are a work in progress and God does not seem to want to complete the work. So therefore, it's up to you now to take this giant step, declare yourself an independent, underived God, that you can cut the umbilical cord with God and complete yourself. Your declaration of independence from God will be your completion. 
That, then now there you can rest. But right now, you're not complete. That was the lie. The lie. That was the lie that took God's rest and spat it in the face and said, it's not time to rest. Mankind is incomplete until they're independent from you and see that they are gods in themselves and can find all their meaning and their purpose and their future in themselves. And when Adam and Eve believed the lie, they were plunged into meaningless labor. Doing what? Seeking to do that something that would complete them. They, they in fact, brought into language a, a new set of con containers of ideas that I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I am not able. Not, not, not. I cannot. I will not. I have not. I will not be. That, that's mankind. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I'm, I'm not enough to do this job. I'm not enough to be this person I'm supposed to be. I, I'm, I'm not enough in myself to please God. I'm not enough. All religion is built on that. You're not enough, so come on, let's go to church, hear a few formulas, walk down the aisle and say, God, I promise you, I'll do this to become enough. Meaning you're resting for nothing because I'm not enough. Huh. So I've got to do something to complete myself. God says, <laughs> you're complete. Sin was the demonic idea that you're not complete and you'll find your completion in thrusting forth your independent self. And Adam was deceived. The Bible says that, that's sin. You were deceived to believe that he should be more than he was and he could be if he tried hard enough. So instead of entering God's rest, he entered a fear-dominated chaos of his own making. He is tormented. He's driven by condemnation that he's not enough. But try harder, try harder to be what a human should be, which obviously you're not. Every challenge, every opportunity, he is driven to do something, to struggle to become enough to handle it resulting in this other new word that sprang about fear, anxiety, shame of not being enough, envy because I want what my neighbor has because he seems to be enough, and she's always got enough, it looks like it anyway, but then you do what the neighbors do and put on a mask to hide insufficiency that only deepens anxiety. And, and in the darkness of the night when no one else is talking, in that screaming silence, you scream, I'm not enough. And again, I say, you go to church just to feel better, and he tells you you're not enough, that you're no good, and that you've got to do this and do this and do this in order for God to love you. But the fact is, read it. I don't know where people get things from. Read it in Genesis. God never rejected Adam. God's love for Adam, actually, we see it as being bigger than we thought, more vast. For when Adam did what he did, Adam relentlessly pursued him through the darkness and the chaos. God came into his unrest that Adam had brought on himself. And so we come to Jesus. Jesus is that relentless God love, fulfilling the intention that has been there from the very beginning. Jesus is God coming inside our humanness to fulfill the dream of God before creation. He is God who is now the expressing himself as he will not be God without us. I know I say that a lot. Have you got it? I mean, can, can you make that the pillow of your <laughs> dreams tonight? 
that God in his love from how we know him from the unbeginning, as we open our eyes in creation, he is the God who refuses to be God without you. He made you to unite with you and to know you and love you and fellowship and friend you and live your life with you as you live your life with him. Now that's the intention of God, and yet he doesn't give it up. He doesn't dump at him. He pursues that to the utter end, which is he became one of us. God became one of us. Isn't it incredible? Adam, in the deception, wanted to be as God, while the real God wanted and was determined to become Adam. Isn't that something? Adam says, I'm no good. I've got to try and be like God. God says, you are so just as I made you. I, I want to come and live in and become one with you. So when Jesus is born, it's, we call that in theology incarnation. It means God comes and becomes one of us without ever ceasing to be the Son of God. It means that that God who in the beginning rested and said, all is perfect. Now that God who rested becomes the rest inside the human. God came to live as human was always created to be. And he comes to live human and show us in himself what the rest of God looks like. He, he is a genuine human. He faces everything we face, but he faced it all from within the rest of God for which we were created. You could say that Jesus did not come only to reveal what God was like by any means. The, the, what hits you in the face is that he came to reveal to us who we really are and what we were created to be, to be at rest in union relationship with God the Father. And, and so he who is God came to show humans in himself what a human is supposed to be, that was made to be. And, and that is fascinating because most people, if you talk about God and you say, what's God like? They say, power. Yeah, that is not true, not true. Because if, if I look at Jesus, that certainly is not what he revealed. I mean, are you going to say, well, God, God, well, he, he sort of, he's everywhere and he knows everything. That's God. Well, then Jesus didn't reveal God because he wasn't knowing everything and being everywhere. No, of course not, because God isn't power and God isn't just knowing everything and God isn't just everywhere. God is love. And Jesus perfectly imaged God by being love among us. Only he didn't originate life from himself. He originated, he derived, he received, he took life from the Father. So that he said more than once, of my own self I could do nothing. Everything I do, I, I am deriving from the Father. And he called us. Can you see this? He's, he's walking in, in among us in this incredible love and peace and joy that overcame the chaos around him. And he brings the action of love wherever he goes. And in perfect rest, he's not trying to do it, not trying to become, but receiving and living. So... Without my Father, I can do nothing. I hear what He's saying, and I, I, I say the same thing, and I, I, I see what He's doing, and I join Him in doing it. And so what I do, we do. And He called us right there as He walked among us in all of our fears and shame, anxiety, chaos. He called us to enjoy the same knowledge 
join him in the same rest. Oh, you, you know the text, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle, humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Hmm. Let, let me read that to you in the message paraphrase. Listen, this is what he says. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love that. In fact, if I've ever signed a book for you, I've always included that verse underneath it. That's the very center of my life. Now, now this Jesus, he's inviting us to come into his rest and to have the relationship that he has with the Father as ours. So in coming into union with him, we also come into union with the Father. And he says it plainly. I don't know a verse that says it plainer. That we then would actually rest with his rest and, and we would walk in life in, in what he speaks of in the, in the message, paraphrase, the, these unforced rhythms of grace. Look, look, what is that? That's effortless. That, that's, I am living, but I'm living from such a gentle current of God's grace and love that my life is effortless. How could he say that? Well, look at it like this. He is, and I say it again and again, 101% genuine, authentic, human. That's God's eternal purpose to become one of us. But at the same time, he is God, creator. Well, what does that mean then? That this one genuine human is in actual fact worth equal to at least the entire creation and beyond. But especially he is equal to the entire human race. He's one of us. And because he's one of us, he can specifically be the one who is equal to us all. He takes every one of us in. You are part of this, this person. Oh, put it like this. He, he's not living just a private human life. There is, a, yes, he did. He was a carpenter in Nazareth. He had a next door neighbor and, and no one dreamed who he was. That's absolutely biblically true. But standing back and taking in the entire event, he is in fact the one who is equal to and worth every human being the human race is comprised of. And not as a blur or a blob, but he knows you by name. He is your creator and he is worth you and embraces you in his being among us. Or another word that is used is the representative man. And by that, I don't mean he's the ultimate Congress person. Uh, you know what I mean? They're supposed to represent us, but I doubt they know your name. I doubt they know how many kids you have unless they're looking at some report. No, when I say representative, I mean for real, you are in him. You are held in his embrace. You are truly in him. His history is truly your history, your history is truly his. 
He lived the rest as our true selves. So he not only imaged God, but he included you in himself. God won with us to show us who we truly are. The blueprint of humanity became human and lived the blueprint. He is saying, look at me, I'm your true life, all that you're intended to be. Come to me and discover yourself as you were planned to be. And so he came not merely to live that life in front of us, um, because <laughs> that would be sad, wouldn't it? If Jesus was just living that life in front of us, so he shows us what we ought to be, what we should be. Boy, doesn't that sound like Sunday morning in some churches? No, Jesus came to actually, actually rescue us one by one, you, me, to restore you, me, not merely to show us what we ought to be. He came to the heart of our darkness, our ignorance, our illusion of our not-enoughness. He came into the rage of mankind against the love and grace of God, that threatened false independence. He loved us, and He loved us. He loved us until all human ideas of love run out. And he keeps on this love. He declared that whatever we would do to him, he wouldn't give up. That was easy to say, wasn't it? Listen to me. Whatever we would do to him, in our insistence upon making the lie into the truth of life, whatever we would do to get rid of him, he would never quit loving us. He would take it, take it, take it. Whatever we did, he would take it in order to be where we are. If that's where you are in your feelings about me, he says, then I'll come and join you there and you do what you have to do. But I'm not quitting. I'm not leaving you. I'll reveal to you the extent of my love. And that's, that's what happened at the cross, the whole cross event. That's what's happening. Jesus placed himself in the hands of wicked men who were representatives, in fact, of the wicked world. Because all around what happened at the cross, you have just about everybody represented. There you've got the secular people. You've got the religious, for sure. You, you've got the Jew and the Gentile. On the one hand, secular, you've got the might of Rome that believed that they could conquer the world by the crush of their boot. And on the other end, you had the extremely religious, the Pharisee. You, you had the political religious who were the Sadducee. They were, all, they were all there. You and I, we were there represented, but I say that representation's real. And you do know that nobody arrested Jesus. He, he goes to the garden, and in that agony of the garden, he, he makes that final choice of his being to give himself to us, to the ultimate. And so they came to arrest him, do you remember? And all he says was, I am. And they all fell back on their backs. They couldn't get up. Couldn't arrest him. So he, he had to sort of arrest himself. He put out his hands. He said, please let me. And, and before you arrest me, let me heal this. And, and he healed. You remember? He gave himself to wickedness. He gave himself. He was saying, I'm coming in to love you. And so do what you will that I might find the depths of your heart and love you in the depth of your wickedness. And so they, they mocked him. It's a mockery of justice. And of course, he'd been betrayed by one of his closest friends. His disciples had fled like frightened rabbits. And the, the couple that hung around, they, they denied that they knew him. He was tortured physically. He was tortured mentally and emotionally. And I... I I can only say it, 
because you won't find any pictures to back it up. But if you study Roman crucifixion, it was in fact a sexual abuse of stripping a person naked and nailing them up in front of everybody naked to be mocked. Every form of abuse known to humans, Jesus took it. And you remember all through the account, it says he, he didn't say a word. He, he didn't threaten them and say, don't you know who I am? I'll get you for this. Don't, don't you realize, no, once did he say, you'll all die in hell for this. No, he didn't answer a word. He remained silent. Accepting. Well, if you're, if you're remaining silent while people do this to you, what are you doing? You're accepting everything that was thrown at him. He's not pushing it away in anger. He's not blocking it by threatening revenge. He takes their mockery. He takes their condemnation by which they've crucified him. And in so doing, the sin of every one of us is laid upon him. He becomes the sin of mankind. And also the reverse of that, those who have been abused, those who have been mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually abused, Jesus represents. He takes it and he took the fullest that all hell could lay upon him of that abuse. So the Bible says he became sin. And he took that sin from their mouths, from their hands, their actions, their hatred, in which was our hands and our actions. And all the time, Satan, with every principality and power, was mauling him. Every power of the lie, the fullness of darkness was hurled and hurled at its worst at him until they were done. The soldiers couldn't do any more. They, they, they've done everything that wickedness can ever conceive to do. They're, they're finished. The last thing they did is took his clothes and they'd ripped off his body. And now the, you can hear the rattle of their dice upon the rock uh, as they're gambling for what possessions he had. I mean, it's finished. They're over. All they can do now is turn their backs on him and, and gamble. It's, you, you don't understand. I mean, they've got nothing else to do. I mean, we, uh, they've beaten him to a pulp. They, they've mocked him until their voices are heard. Horse and Satan has given his worst. They're done. Wickedness cannot do any more. They've got nothing else to give. And do you understand you're in him? He, he's taken me with all my screw up of life, all of my darkness and my ignorance. He embraced me. He said, I'll take that. I'll take it. And he's doing the same for you and for you. I mean, most literally, the man upon the cross is every one of us. We're there. And at the same time, the men who crucified him, we're, we're relating to them too. This, this, this moment is a cosmic moment in which we're there. It's not a charade. I'm trying to emphasize, you were there. He stood where we stood. He felt what we feel. He experienced our darkness, our sense of abandonment. He kept coming to receive the wickedness until he stood in the middle of the sewer of darkness that we call existence in life. Huh. The very last thing, that sin and condemnation and the darkness and the Satan could throw at him was death. That's all they got left. And in the middle of all that, he speaks. And he speaks, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They're blind. They're ignorant. 
So, Father, forgive them. What, what's that mean? It means that the Father and Jesus are on the same page. He can say, Father, you and I agree on this. Forgive them. Forgive them. And I'm looking at the secular might of Rome. I'm looking at the religious Pharisee. I'm looking at the politically religious. I'm looking at the whole mass of people that stood there. As well as every one of us on the inside, Jesus taking our absolute person and place, becoming us. Forgive, forgive. Mankind has done their worst. And the response is, now I'm meeting you face to face in your darkness and I've got one message for you. You're forgiven. There's no condemnation. It's total forgiveness and compassion for the ignorance of those who sin. And before he hands himself over to death, he shouted, if I was there, that would have been spooky because he has been beaten to, to nothingness and yet he shouts. Where did he get the shout from? He shouted, it is finished. This is interesting because wickedness, wickedness is finished. Do you, do you understand? Wickedness has exhausted its resources. It's got nothing else to do against him. And now he cries, it is finished. So they said, in effect, they're finished. He says, and I'm finished. Finished, completed, done to perfection, nothing to be added, nothing to be subtracted. He is God himself entering into the depth of creation to finish the creation. He's... He's come to remove all that would separate and blind his beloved human from the love that he has. And so he entered into death, carrying all the sin that they, we, had put upon him. All the condemnation wraps its filthy hands around him, the shame the rejection of religion, the tyranny of Rome, the fickle disciples, all goes to death. All of my screwed up life, all of every wrongness that you continually rehash in your mind. It, 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 you see, that's it. It was there. And you can watch it. Watch it. Happening. It's going into the death. He's, he's, his arms are big enough to embrace the human race and he carries it into death. It's over. It's over. Done. He was dead. Oh, you, wickedness can't improve on that. That's the worst they can do. He's dead. And everything that he embraced that took him to death died with him. And wickedness went on a party. The disciples and friends wept hopeless tears. And when I say hopeless, I mean hopeless. There is nothing left. The one that they had hoped is not. And then, and I like it, they put a great stone over the mouth of the cave, which was the tomb. Actually, we know from history, it took 10 men to roll that stone in place. It'll take even more to get it out to the rollers that it was on. The door was then sealed with the seal of Rome. If you moved that stone, you'd break the seal of Rome. They set a 24-hour guard because they were afraid the disciples would come to steal the body. They guarded and sealed the tomb against persons coming from the outside to steal the body. They had no comprehension that one would be coming from inside the tomb. They didn't guard the inside of the tomb. They guarded against those coming from outside. Huh. They had mustered all evil and darkness into that one moment, death, that got nothing left. Wickedness apparently has won and exhausted itself. 
They had declared him to be impotent against their power. But the Father raised him from the dead. Jesus stood up in the tomb, folded the grave clothes. The great stone is tossed like a quarter in the wind. And the guards fled in terror. He walked out alive in a touchable body, but a life and a body you've never seen before. There was no words, no imagination, no vocabulary to say what had happened. Because everything that went into the tomb was left there. And he came out without it. But not only without it, with something human race had never seen before. You see, it meant that the worst that any man could ever do, the sin of every man and woman, the full power of darkness and wickedness, Satan and every principality, power and demon, and death itself. Oh, they were finished all right. Not in the way they thought. You did your worst, and love took it, and collapsed it by the holy love that he is. He poured out his life blood, submitting to our sin, took it and carried it away, cleansed, cancelled all its effects. He rose from death. All that caused death was no more. Satan did his worst and utterly failed. He came out of the tomb. But not merely, I say, merely coming out of the tomb, but he overcame the darkness. That is, he is the one representing you and I. He stepped out of the tomb with an entirely new kind of human life. A life that would never know condemnation, never know guilt or shame, never know the tyranny of sin, never know the oppression of the darkness. And even in death would laugh and know that we sorrow not as others which have no hope. He had a new life, but it's a new life that changed everything. Because everything that is now past has got to be revisited. I thought, I thought, I thought that was the truth. But it's not, you see, it's not, not. It's not the way you thought it was. And everything in the future is now filled with hope. If, if, if death is defeated, if there's no more condemnation, if never again sin will be hung over my head, then I've got a future that I've got to sit down and discover. And my present then, love has kicked out fear, anxiety, and, and, and the power of sin, the destructive power of Satan's tyranny. You see, the life that came out of that tomb had faced all of that and let them have their fullest rage against him and now stood alive while the darkness stood in confusion and disarray. And out from the heart of God there began a laugh that rolled through all the ages like a great song. Jesus said it in the parables, the shepherd is coming back from the wilderness, bringing the sheep with him, and he's saying, rejoice with me, I found my sheep. Or Psalm 126. It, 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 it's an echo of this. It says, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with singing. Or Psalm 30, verse 11, he says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've put off my sackcloth. You've clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Do you understand me? You're standing right here in front of the resurrection. 
Do you know what that means? Uh, you know, I, I put it this way. He didn't take away wickedness because wickedness is still here for sure. Nor did he take away Satan because Satan's still here. Then, then what, what, what is it? Don't you get it? It is their ongoing judgment to still be here. I think Satan would rather not be here. Do you understand that? The judgment of Satan is that he's still here with nothing. Every power that Satan claimed was brought out at the cross to its fullest extent and then shown to be nothing. When Satan was exhausted in giving his worst and they laid Jesus in the tomb, then Jesus comes out of the tomb and every, every, every power that Satan deceived us that he was had has been exposed as nothing. So every time we meet Satan, whenever Satan approaches, whenever sin approaches the believer, whenever condemnation and guilt comes, whispering a thousand whispers in your ear, what? What do you do? Do you hear that? What what is being said? Do, do you cower before it? No. Join the resurrection and laugh. The laughter that began at the resurrection is the terrible reminder to sin and to Satan and to the darkness that they've lost. And he has to go through it over and over and over again. You're tempted to sin. Laugh. Laugh, because the resurrection has exposed the idiot. He's done. He's complete. Because the man who represented every one of us, I was in him. It's done. It's finished. Sin is not the great power anymore. It's been exposed as insanity. It doesn't work. We... we we un unwaveringly look to Jesus and we refuse the distraction of feelings and appearances. And we know that he's finished. He did it. It's done to perfection. And that which began back in Genesis 1 has now come to its fullest. That we rest in what God has done in Jesus and we are joined into it and his rest is our rest and we live in the great it is finished and there's not a wickedness and not a darkness not a demon on the planet that wasn't there and heard the laugh of God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit that we joined him with and said he did it and they cower in the darkness a shame that they lost when they gave everything they'd got to give. Because what we're inside of now is a new kind of life that has already overcome all sin and all the darkness. We're in a life that has fellowship with the Father. We're in a life that has already overcome sin. It is the, the reveling of forgiveness. We're released from all guilt. Why? Because he rose from the dead and that was the end of it. In him you've entered the new reality, the new creation, the new possible. You're at home in the heart and embrace of the Father, fully alive. And when we lay hold upon that, you're at rest. Let me just say this and I'm done. To enter into the rest. The word enter is the same word that used for entering a city or entering a house or a boat. It's also used of entering the kingdom. And it, it means there's no work to be done. Just enter in. Or could I put it this way? Allow it to be given to you. It is so. You're sitting in a chair? Why don't you just stand up out of the chair and just realize it is and as surely as I simply stood, so I simply enter. It is. The resurrection has caused it to be done and finished. And the laughter rolls through your life. 
as you rest in him. And now the blessing of God, who is almighty resurrection love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, his blessing lay hold upon you this night and this week, opening the eyes of your understanding to know the exceeding greatness of his power toward you, which is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So I bless you that you shall is into the rest of God. That's the way it is.